You're all very welcome this morning to today's webinar, and this is part of the HCI webinar series. My name is Una Gilvary, and I'm the CTO of Healthcare Informed HCI. And today we're going to be looking at a number of um, UK and Irish inquiries that have been completed, and we're just trying to consider if there's some commonalities that we can identify across um, uh, these investigations and, and kind of look at, at learnings that we can take uh, and apply to our own organisation and our own services and see if, if we can learn uh, in that regard. So we are uh, providers of health and social care services. Uh, we support organisations to make intelligence driven decisions to attain, manage and improve their quality and safety and regulatory compliance. So to talk about why we are actually here today and, and spend some time, I suppose, considering um, the approach that we're going to take this morning. And I, I would say we'd probably be here for maybe about uh, 25, 30 minutes. We don't have a huge amount of time, so it really is a, a bit of a skim through, but hopefully you'll be able to pick up a little bit of learning along the way. I suppose when we think of inquiries uh, and scandals, health uh, healthcare, health and social care related scandals, we're all very aware of the headlines um, across um, uh, across the, the, the news parties, not only from the UK, but obviously across Ireland as well. Um, there's some significant uh, scandals come, come to mind. And from that, I suppose, HCI decided that we were going to take a pretty detailed look into these inquiries, the reports that arose from these inquiries and see what could we identify uh, as commonalities across these investigations or inquiries and see if we could take any learning and take some proactive measures uh, that we could consider for our clients. So these are the, some of the UK inquiries that we looked at and some of the Irish inquiries uh, specifically. Now today I'm actually going to add on some some newer elements of some um, with the Oak and Dean and, um, and um, the, the East Kent. We're going to have a little look at those also, but we're going to try and pull the learnings from here and see what were the themes and commonalities that we identified uh, when we took that time to, to complete this research. And these are the common common uh, themes that we found. So within each and every one of the incident uh, and investigation reviews and, and the reports that came from them, there were significant issues identified across the board in each of those in each of these themes. So particularly, I suppose, governance. And for any of you who know HCI, we always begin been at governance, but that's really where, where it all starts, I suppose, in relation to if we if there are failings within an organisation, if we look to the governance model generally, um, it is reflective of a weak governance model, a, a governance model that is, is somewhat underdeveloped or incorrectly focused. And we saw across the board that within these um, investigations, there certainly was a significant lack of oversight in the governance model and a, a general confusion um, in relation to what the governance structure should look like, what those roles and responsibilities, not only for individuals, but also for teams um, should be looking at. And that the focus in many of these organisations was incorrect, that there may be a focus uh, within the management or within the senior, the trust um, on, on a financial model, rather than focusing on, on the service, the patient and, and safety and, and, and quality that of the service that's being provided. So that was certainly one area that came came to the fore. And we're going to look specifically at, at, at a number of them and see what types of problems that they were encountering in relation to governance. Culture is really uh, something that came through again and again, and it's a difficult one to get a handle on. But throughout um, the, the, the investigations that we looked at, there was a very clear toxic culture in, in many of those with that sufficient division between them and us. It was always um, what we want and what they want, and they don't understand us and um, they're against us. And there was a real division, which led to significant amount of bullying also uh, within the environment. So we're going to take a look at some of the key problems in that regard. Person-centred care, obviously, I mean, the outputs of all of these was, was the direct impact on the patients that were within the service. but it was clear across the board that there was a general disregard for best practice uh, in relation to per person-centred care, an innate belief that that the people providing care were able to make the, the central decisions on their own bat without utilising evidence-based best practice or, or, the, or the clinical guidelines that were available to them. So we're going to look at that also. 
incident management and complaint management across the board came in for a significant amount of review, um, particularly um, the protective nature of the approach uh, by organisations in relation to incident management and complaint management, trying to contain, protect that real lack of transparency when it came to where issues came to the fore and were not uh, came to the, the to the notice of, of of the individuals within the hospitals or within the services but that they were trying to contain them and let as few people know about the issues as possible and from that obviously no learning uh, arose from that so we're going to, to look at that too risk management again a problem across the board primarily because people uh, it seemed there was a lack of understanding about what risk management actually was and whether if there was risk management, it was certainly very reactive. It wasn't proactive. There was no trying to get out ahead um, of hazards and risks and address them and put controls in place. Uh, but rather than uh, rather than just allowing the problem to happen and then trying to put a piecemeal effort in place following from that. And back up towards the governance then was in relation to problems in relation to monitoring of data. In some cases where they never went looking, that the, the, the system wasn't actually producing any data of value, but in other cases where information and data was uh, being created, but it just simply wasn't being utilized, it wasn't being trended, it wasn't being analyzed, and it certainly wasn't going, it wasn't being monitored by the powers that be to, to which would allow them to, to actually make uh, a change or, or some kind of continuous improvement for the organizations or services. So these are the consistent themes that we saw across the board when we looked at that grouping. So what I wanted to do today was just pull out um, a couple of these, uh, or a few of these uh, across the UK and, and of the Irish inquiries and see from the specifics, the commonalities in this. Now, for the UK ones, I've pulled <clears throat> uh, three maternity related um, in, uh, investigations. These findings are not specific to maternity. They're, they're certainly applicable across the health and social care services, but it just provides a little bit of consistency, I suppose, in, uh, across the board. So if we go back in time a little bit, and I suppose we've all heard of, of Morecambe Bay, um, but when we look back at the reports that arose from that, we can see that the, the inquiry highlighted serious failings in the clinical care of the maternity unit in Furness. And the result was avoidable harm to mothers and babies, with, including tragic and unnecessary deaths. The report itself detailed damning criticisms, not only of the unit, but of the wider trust and uh, the regulatory and supervisory uh, system. So if we take a number of those themes that we've talked about already, let's look at some of the specific findings for Morka Bay and some of the problems that they identified uh, within that service. So from a governance perspective, they immediately identified that there was extraordinarily poor clinical governance and that there was no formal oversight in quality and safety managers, particularly again, that financial focus came to the fore for the trust um, rather than identifying key performance indicators that would be reflective of quality and patient safety care and utilizing them as a measure of success. The measure of success uh, was, was elsewhere and uh, more financially based. They also found that there was a huge level of management instability. So there was constant changings, not only in the structure itself, but also in the roles and responsibilities. They combined roles, they split roles out. And as a result, the lines of responsibility became very blurred. People were responsible for one area <clears throat> for a short period of time, then they were responsible for something else, then it was combined. So there was a consistent changing of the guard, uh, which led to a lack of engagement within management in the particular services uh, to try and engage and, and drive continuous improvement. And in many cases, management were given posts that they simply didn't have the experience um, to be able to, to, to support that model. The culture itself seemed to be a particular area of concern uh, arising from the report. That division was very clear, the midwives versus the obstetricians, and then the significant focus on the natural birth at all costs. And we see this again coming through in the Oakendean uh, report, where it was almost held as a badge of honour in relation to ensuring to reducing the numbers um, of, of sections that were completed. And it was that central focus on natural, natural birth. When the investigation was initiated, there was significant pushback from the organisation or the staff within it, where they felt there was a real denial of that there was any actual problems and that the deaths were just part of the natural process of things. And then, and that, 
and arising from that, there was no real investigations completed when an incident or, or a, a SUI did, a, did arise. And they felt that the criticism was very unfair. So because of that, there was that lack of transparency or openness uh, to try and learn from, uh, from the issues that were there. And arising from that, they found a culture of cover up where charts were going missing and really that containment and protectionism um, uh, throughout the service. In relation to complaints, again, the focus when they did set a KPI for complaints, they focused only on processing times. They weren't interested really in uh, the, the information that was arising from these complaints or any trends that might be arising from complaints. It was only how quickly did you get the complaint closed, irrespective of the quality of that complaint. It was evident that the board weren't interested in any of the learnings that were arising from it. And in many cases, there was very unsatisfactory conclusions from the, com the complaints that arose from those families. Incident management, and I will talk about it here and in some of the other ones that we're going to look at this morning, but this was one of the primary indicators of significant problems throughout the organization because of this protectionist mechanisms. So in this case, stillbirths in many cases were unreported um, as a serious and towards uh, incidents. And, and in some other cases, it was a very piecemeal effort that was applied. They were reviewed internally by a very small group of people. There was no communication of findings, no root cause analysis, and it was a very superficial, <clears throat> excuse me, process um, in relation to it. So again, that, that real containment, protectionism and lack of transparency or, or, or any real regard for, for driving learning or continuous improvement. The person-centred care then uh, under that theme, there was a particular problem. And again, we will see this, this lack of escalation. We'll manage it ourselves. We'll wait and see. We'll try and contain it. We won't engage with other services or other departments. Uh, but in many cases, um, the, the, the delays were simply just, just too long and, and it was too late by the time escalation occurred. There was failure to monitor clinical de uh, deterioration and a real failure to communicate concerns where there were falling clinical standards. So where there was recognition that things were not going right, that was there was no communication of that um, up, or, or, uh, up through the organisation. And that is, is support, I suppose, but because the culture was so uh, was so toxic at that in, in that regard. Arising from that report, there were recommendations for um, so four key areas, I suppose. One, clinical governance oversight. They they identified that much more oversight was required and that they needed clarity of the roles. They wanted more development in clinical competency. They wanted a review of the skills and knowledge of staff to try and support a culture of openness. They wanted um, a much more robust instant process that was exposed to external parties. And they wanted to look at those policies and procedures um, and ensure that they're reflective of evidence-based best practice and, and clinical guidelines. So that's back 2015. And, and there was a, a lot of really detailed recommendations that arose from Morecambe Bay. So coming up a little bit more recently, and this, uh, the Oak and Dean Review was just released in March of this year over, it had been ongoing over a, a, a significant period of time. And again, I'm sure you're all very aware because of, you know, and it is quite recent, they identified that 201 babies could have survived had better care been provided um, and that so many babies suffered severe brain injuries, cerebral palsy and significant or major concerns uh, were identified within the care provided. And of the 12 maternal deaths, they identified that none of them had received care uh, with best in line with best practice. But if we take those same themes again and look at the summary of findings, we can almost um, uh, just layer them on top of the Morecambe Bay findings, they are almost uh, directly comparable. So for governance, a lack of clarity of roles and responsibilities again, the trust not having oversight in those issues of service, neither did they look for it, nor, nor was it provided to them. And the leadership team, again, in constant churn, individuals went in, they did their six months on a, on a senior management team. There wasn't really any engagement with them and there was no particular drive uh, to work towards continuous improvement in that regard. They kind of clocked in and clocked out in many cases because they were overloaded with their own clinical work um, as well as and, and then being requested to, 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 to serve on these boards. The culture, again, really reflective of that them and us and, uh, and some of the harrowing um, a testimony of, of junior staff where they cried their entire way through um, 
through shifts because of bullying um, and a real undermining culture um, within, the, within the service. Again, that drive to keep cesarean section rates low, the badge of honour trying to keep it that we're doing a wonderful job. That's our measure of quality um, uh, care because our cesarean section rates are low rather than looking at KPIs that were reflective of the, the quality and safety of care that was being provided. Again, for complaints, patients not listened to, complaints dismissed. A lot of response letters were made up. Uh, they had information that, that was incorrect. And actually complaints justifying the actions of staff and blaming families themselves for the outcomes that arose. Incident management really was so comparable. In Internal reviews were really cursory or they weren't completed at all. What the, the particular group that was responsible for um, investigation of incidents continually downgraded serious incidents so that they could manage the process themselves, where they knew that they, if they were classified as a higher grade, then that they would be exposed to external scrutiny, which would blow, uh, blow the case wide open, so to speak. So they continually downgraded them and contain, contained it. And when investigation did take place, it was, uh, it was, it really was very cursory, and there was no underlying problems identified. In-person centred care, again, repeated patterns of, of, of poor care with that overconfidence in abilities, a failure to escalate concerns, that wait and see, and again, failure to follow those national guidelines. So when that, uh, as said very recently, again, the recommendations very comparable. We have governance, we're looking for an effective org structure with key quality and safety indicators, critical competency. We wanted a single set of training targets, uh, incident management, again, looking for a more robust investigation process and those clinical guidelines being utilized for our policies and procedures. So when the Oak and Dean review came out or that report came out, obviously it had shocking revelations and there was real uh, concern and upset in relation to the content, but it was picked up by others that the, the most frightening element of it was the similarity of the NHS, the scandals across the board. So Dr. Joe, uh, Alex Jones of, of Cardiff University, he, he flagged this. His concerns were over the repetitive and endemic nature of the care failings in the NHS and that you could cut and paste recommendations made in reports from back in the 1960s. And he felt that that was a sobering message. He noted that while the review focused on shocking revelations, it was the consistency with other reports such as Morecambe Bay back in 2015, that was most concerning. And he felt that organisations change, but yet the culture was remaining the same. Just bringing it right up to date, I suppose, in relation to East Kent and, and the first of, of those reports um, coming out in October of this year, again, babies suffering of suboptimal care. And if we look at the summary findings, and I won't go into detail again, very, very similar findings that we've seen in Morgan Bay, that we've seen in Oakendine, and, and, and now reflective here. Again, changing leadership divides between the organization, um, uh, repeatedly take, uh, failing to take responsibility for errors, incidents being held internally, keep them in-house, um, and, and, and slow to adopt those new national recommendations. So very comparable. Interestingly, though, when that report came to uh, came came through. It's probably the first of many. It detailed within the report, we have not sought to set out detailed list of things that the trust must do. The trust has had numerous previous action plans that have not worked. And those action plans based on uh, the, the Morecambe Bays and, and the Oak and Deans, the new leadership of the trust will read this report and can see exactly what has gone wrong and what needs to be put right. The phrase never again is starting to ring hollow. So again, the the organizations, the information is there to them in relation to the problems that are available or the problems that are arising and the, the, the recommended actions that are required, but yet we're not getting them across the line and the changes are not occurring uh, uh, in this instant within the service. Now, within the Irish invest, uh, investigations and inquiries, again, exactly the same in relation to the commonality of themes. And I've just pulled out two and we probably won't have time to go into to full detail on that. But specifically in relation to Savita Halapanavar, um, I'm sure again, you're all aware of that. Savita died seven days into her admission to a hospital where she was admitted for the management of inevitable miscarriage. And again, 
those themes come up again and again and again, particularly, I said, in person-centered care, that lack of basic care, those missed opportunities to provide care, failure to recognize the clinical deterioration, and then no formal process for incorporating best practice into those policies and procedures. And they found that really there was significant under the culture element deficits in how learning had been adopted from follow, following previous investigations. So all the information and knowledge was there, but yet it wasn't being transferred across and incorporated and driven through within the service so that we could have a proactive response to uh, issues that occurred elsewhere. And the recommendations, very similar, governance, critical competency, incident management and clinical guidelines, the repetitive nature of those. And again, in Port Yonkla, I won't go into those, it was def deficiencies in, par in part on care. Similar elements again, uh, in a uh, lack of open disclosure, um, incident management, not following the principles that they had in place. So although they had a robust incident management process written, those pro that process wasn't being implemented for the investigations that were being completed. And again, clinical maternity guidelines not being implemented. So um, again, very comparable for the recommendations. So what are we taking from that? We had these commonality of themes. And as I said, we have a vast suite of the of the inquiries that we looked at and that paper, uh, uh, will we ever learn, um, is available to you. I mean, it, all of the information is trended and, 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 and uh, uh, um, gathered within that report so we can see the consistent nature of the failings across the board. And as I said, it's not, this is not just in relation to maternity services, this is really across the board. But when we look at that commonality, what really is the overall uh, commonality is the lack of learning. Um, and, and and our inability to, to be able to try and move it from 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 an external report and bring it in internally and, and get it across the line. Our own health, uh, health Information Quality Authority detailed their concern was there is a fundamental and worrying deficit in health health systems, namely the ability to implement system wide learning from adverse events in a timely and appropriate manner in order to prevent the reoccurrence of patient safety events that may cause harm or worse to patients. So what do we do about this? What what can we do? Now I'm going to talk about some HCI supports, but really I'm going to talk generally about some of the activities you can undertake within your organisations um, to try and, I suppose, take these learnings and, and get out of get ahead of of uh, some of the issues that we've looked at there today. So governance, as I said. It's it's the the cornerstone for us, particularly, and it's the cornerstone for all um, health and service, uh, health and care, health and social care services. But it's really important to know how robust and how comprehensive our governance model is. And that takes time to do. Um, and in many cases, what is very effective is to complete an overall governance review. Now, that's something that we complete ourselves, but organizations can complete internally where they look at um, the evidence-based best practice are the regulation and the requirements that are in that that are, are applicable and doing a gap analysis against that. So really having an appropriate measure and seeing, well, you know, where is the, uh, where uh, uh, does our governance model sit in relation to best practice? How are the roles and responsibilities identified? How are they divided? Um, is, is there a appropriate time allocated to those people within uh, fulfilling governance roles to be able to, 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 to fulfill their roles and responsibilities in that regard? What are the teams and committees like that we have in our organizations? Do we have clarity in relation to our terms of references, our agendas? Is there appropriate minutes follow up uh, on the actions that are there? Um, and really trying to take that governance model and do a, a really structured analysis. Have we appropriate KPIs in place to be able to support the governance review activities that we need to? We're going to talk about quality and safety data analysis in a minute. But part of that governance review is really looking in detail at your quality and safety management system and seeing how robust are the models that we have, are the processes that we have in place to support each of these themes? Have we a robust model in place for our complaints and incident management? Have we a robust model in place 
for risk management? Um, is our auditing and monitoring process sufficiently robust and comprehensive in detail? So taking the time at the earlier stage in the governance uh, reviews to look at that quality and safety management model um, and seeing how can it support us in providing the quality and safety of care that we need to provide. Um, in relation to culture, and culture is a tricky one, um, um, is in, in really trying to identify the culture. It can be very deceptive in relation to the culture you think you have within your service and the culture that's actually there. Now, we're actually licensed to provide surveys. Um, it's, it's the Survey for Patient Safety Culture that was developed by the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality. And that's a licensed survey that incorporates evidence-based best practice. Um, and it helps to really identify the areas that require quality improvement initiatives. Um, so it, 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 it's, a, it's a really successful tool in drilling down and really seeing the culture of the organization. And from that, I suppose, not only are you trying to drill down, identify key areas for improvement, but it's also opening the organization saying, look, we, we're interested in being an open culture. We want to be an open culture. We want transparency. We want your feedback um, and, and, and really try to crack that nut open to try and get that level of transparency. Um, so that, that's one approach in relation to culture. In relation to person-centered care, I suppose there's two key areas, and that's your policies and procedures and, and your education and training. Um, for ourselves, we have an evidence, we have a, a best practice department. Their key focus is ensuring that, uh, that we can develop our, the, the, uh, with our clients the evidence-based best practice policies and procedures. Uh, but also it's really important that we work with organizations to do the process mapping. And I think that's something that many organizations miss out when they are developing their policies and procedures, that there is just that lumping of the re requirements and, and, and lumping in of the, um, of the best practice without actually process mapping it out and getting that general agreement across the board in how we actually do things on a day-to-day -day basis and what's going to make this work. There's many organizations that have beautiful policies and procedures that sit on a shelf and, and, and get dusty, uh, but we need them to be uh, to be utilized and, and to be, re, you know, be real and, and be engaged with on a day-to-day -day basis and applied uh, throughout. And how are we going to manage the changes and updates and ensuring that they are continually reflective of best practice and coming from that, that education and training that's required in ensuring people are kept up to date. And there is a requirement for that tailoring of education, uh, is, which is something that we support to ensure that we get the right information to the right people um, uh, and, and ensuring that that pra best practice is, is implemented throughout. When it comes to complaint and incident management, I would say this is probably an area of really significant development uh, over the last uh, 12 to 18 months. And certainly it's an area that we are working a lot more in. And that's about bringing in external parties to complete incident or complaint investigations um, where a serious or category one or a serious uh, adverse events uh, has arisen. So again, trying to move away from that containment and restriction and protectionism and trying to open it out to getting the support of external providers to really be able to provide um, a clarity and, and real comprehensive systems analysis. And that's what it's about. It's about systems analysis. It's not about a blame culture. That's not, uh, that's not, not, not the role uh, that we're looking at. It's really about trying to identify what were the weaknesses within the processes and systems um, that allowed these failures to arise, you know, um, trying to identify that, look at those elements um, and then pull out the recommendations, but it's not about just having those recommendations. It's about then working with the organizations to ensure that they're implemented uh, effectively within the organizations, but really significant developments um, in, in those areas. And they have become the, the, the windows to the windows to the soul, as we say, uh, in relation to the if you have a strong complaint and incident management model in place, it really supports the overall um, uh, the overall comprehensiveness or robustness of your quality and safety management system. Risk management, again, I, uh, looking through the, uh, the uh, investigations and even from our own experience, one of the primary problems with risk management is the lack of understanding and the lack of competency uh, and skills that is available um, within services to proactively 
work on risk management. Um, we work with organizations in relation to developing risk registers and, and completing um, risk audits. But a lot of the work is on risk management training and learning that a proactive approach rather than that reactive firefighting approach that's that that, that can be that, that can be uh, really followed up on I suppose in, in a lot of services. The audit and monitoring process again from a broader perspective in many cases we complete gap analysis where we take an overall set of regulations and really benchmark an organization say really how far uh, how close or how far are we from where we need to be um, and, and taking that time to look at what are the QIPs that are mandatory, that really need to be done quite quickly or, uh, and, and others that we can build on um, as we progress working with the service. But it's not, all, it's not just about that overall gap analysis, it's also about building a really comprehensive internal audit program so that we can continually monitor these elements and these teams and have a real effective uh, approach to our monitoring process that, that actually makes a difference and that it's not a box ticking or a paper pushing exercise, uh, but that there are real learnings taken from it and that there is real time taken by the senior management uh, to, 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 to listen to the findings to, and, and to recognize the trends that are coming through from, from an effective audit program. The quality and safety data analysis, again, we, we, you know, looking at, across the board at those inquiries, we can see in many cases either A, the system was, or the service wasn't providing any information or correct information, or in other cases, um, you know, the trust or the, the, the overall board were not interested in the information that was being provided. Um, so we have to be able to listen to our service. And if we have robe ro a robust and, and an effective quality management system, the information that's arising from it has to be central to our focus. So to ensure the quality and safety of care that we're being provided. So again, we work with clients to trend key, uh, trend key data, identify key performance indicators that are a real an effective measure of, of the quality and safety of care. As we think back to that, you know, keeping this, the, the section rates low, I mean, is that a measure of the quality and safety of care being provided? Well, it's more complex than that. So what are the types of information that we need to trend? And, and we again work with, with services with their own software systems or utilizing some of our own software models to really provide that just-in-time data to be able to identify where improvements need to be made. So we're just over our time now uh, for the 30 minutes. Um, I'd like to thank you for your attendance today. If you have any um, queries about anything that I've talked about today, you feel free to uh, link in with us. Also, if you are interested in reading that paper, the research paper, Will We Ever Learn? I know that Rosemary can make it available to you. Um, and also, I think this um, presentation will also be put on our social media chat uh, channel. So if you know somebody who might be interested, um, um, please feel free to uh, let them know. And I'm sure, again, Rosemary will provide you with any contacts that you need. But thank you very much. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again in the new year with some other webinar topics that you might be interested in attending.